Today we'll be covering some Linux and open source news. It's been an exciting week. Let's get into it. KDE Plasma ends its official long-term support releases. In a blog post under the KDE planning team, it says here, it's no secret that our Plasma LTS long-term support product isn't great. And the reason it's being discontinued is because it wasn't living up to expectations. It had limited support, untested backports, and no long-term support for related components like KDE frameworks or gear. Instead, now Plasma plans on giving an extra bug fix release, aka five to six different bug fixes per cycle, which will extend regular support. They're also considering switching from three to two feature releases per year. And this decision has been heavily tied to Wayland issues. The list is shrinking and nearing completion, so they want to focus on that more. And the KDE team believes that the long-term support part of things is supposed to be a distro responsibility. As they say, the distro is doing the hard work of building an LTS final product out of a myriad software components that were never themselves declared LTS by their own developers. It's a lot of work. What this does is frees up KDE to focus on current fixable issues instead of outdated bugs and obsolete stacks. It's important because it's going to affect distributions like Kubuntu, Fedora KDE, and others that rely on Plasma's long-term support additions. It's interesting to see this shift towards Linux distributions, maintaining the long-term support and potentially impacting the stability and update expectations for end users. We'll see how this plays out, but let's move on to another piece of exciting news, Fedora and Windows subsystem for Linux. That's right, it's official now. Fedora 42 has introduced a new image for use with Windows subsystem for Linux, commonly referred to as WSL. This will allow users to have a simple, easy to set up Fedora environment for developmental and testing use. It's quite exciting as this new official WSL image allows Windows users to easily now run Fedora in the Windows subsystem for Linux. It's pre-configured with developer tools and includes tweaks for X11 and Wayland compatibility. Now you can officially run a isolated Linux environment and your choice can be Fedora. It's a big win for Windows and Linux users alike, as Microsoft has officially named it an official WS distro as well. You can try it out today, and this is exciting for developers, especially because it's a bleeding edge distribution, often very developer centric, and Linus Torvalds himself uses it to maintain the Linux kernel. It's very simple to install. If you wanna try it out to install it, you run this WSL install Fedora Linux 42, and then you can launch it by doing this command right here. But that's not all that has officially come over to Windows subsystem for Linux, we now have Arch Linux providing a WSL image as well. These images are built and released monthly, just like you get with an updated ISO from Arch Linux on a monthly basis. You can now run Arch Linux officially on WSL, although originally created on January 29, 2025 here, we officially see an image for April and one expected for May. We also have a new Arch Wiki post called Install Arch Linux on WSL. Arch Linux provides an official WSL Windows subsystem for Linux image as a part of the Arch Linux WSL project. Images are built and released monthly to provide the simplest but complete system to offer outright Arch Linux experience with WSL. And in Arch fashion, the manual here goes thoroughly into how to install. Of course, offering both Arch Linux and Fedora on WSL is a strategic play for Microsoft as it reaches various different users who wouldn't typically use Windows, but if, for example, developers who want a stable modern Linux experience without having to actually dual boot or install a complete image on another disk, they now have a diverse set of options to choose from even when using Windows. Take a moment and subscribe below. You wouldn't want to miss another video like this. YouTube can get finicky. Also, smash that like button on your way back up. Speaking on Fedora, there is a new spin available if you use Fedora. In an announcement, if this is your first time running Fedora Linux, or if you just want to start fresh in an uninhabited system, you can, of course, download the installed media for the flagship editions, including Workstation and what has been promoted to another Workstation edition, KDE Plasma Desktop. So now they have GNOME and KDE Plasma Desktop as their official Workstation editions. They also have Cloud Server, CoreOS, and IoT. For one of our Atomic desktops, including SilverBlue or Kinonite, or for an alternate desktop option like Cinnamon, XFCE, or the new appropriately thematic cosmic desktop spin. 
That's right, with Fedora 42, we officially see Fedora Cosmic being an official spin. You can now download and try out Cosmic without having to install things in the background on your own, which I do have install videos for. If you want to use it side by side with a different desktop environment, that's also a possibility. But now it makes it really easy for users to use Cosmic on Fedora. That's also some exciting news, of course, for us as they are in collaboration with the System76 team to bring us this image. And I gotta say, it works pretty well out of the box, even though we're still in Alpha for Cosmic, specifically Alpha 7. Hopefully to see a beta here soon. But anyways, if you wanna give it a shot, you can now on Fedora Linux, and not just Pop OS. Let's talk about a win for Enterprise. OpenELA has expanded Leap for in-place upgrades across Enterprise Linux. What does this mean? This means that there's now officially an open source upgrade tool that works across multiple different enterprise Linux variants, not just Red Hat. And why is this important? Well, previously in place upgrades were manual, risky, and vendor locked. But now with this initiative, using RHEL clones such as Rocky, Alma, and others can now safely upgrade even in high compliance environments. That definitely opens up being able to use RHEL clones in these types of environments as well. And for those of you unaware, Leap automates and analyzes the complex processes of upgrading from one major version of Linux to another. For example, going from RHEL 7 to 8, or Rocky 8 to 9, what have you. The key features here are pre-upgrade checks and upgrade plan generation, faster reboots now with K-Execute. So the people who typically use Leap here are system admins and enterprises who want to upgrade servers without reinstalling, organizations running, production, enterprise Linux systems that need to avoid downtime, and vendors and distributions who want consistent open tooling for upgrades. And this really matters for major Linux version upgrades that are meant to reinstall or migrate manually, which of course is time consuming and error prone. Leap now is available on more systems. It's safer, repeatable, and scriptable. So it's exciting to see this announcement where it's now available on more enterprise systems. Moving on to a major distribution announcement, Ubuntu 25.10 is not only, as said below, carefully but purposefully oxidizing Ubuntu, as they're making the claim that Ubuntu will be the first major Linux distribution to adopt sudo rs as the default implementation of sudo in partnership with the Trifecta Tech Foundation. It will be effective with the release of 25.10, and you can see the Trifecta Tech announcement here. So what is sudo rs? Sudo rs is a Rust-based implementation, or better yet, re-implementation of the traditional sudo command. And it's a big deal for Ubuntu in announcing this decision to adopt sudo rs in future releases, as it signals serious momentum behind Rust in the core tooling of systems. This is after a announcement that they would be replacing the new core utilities with the Rust core utilities project, and they even give us a progress on porting over the core utilities to Rust. Since the initial announcement, we've been working hard to clearly define a plan for the migration of utilities, core utilities in the 25.10 and beyond. Similarly, our engagement with the Trifecta Tech Foundation, we're also sponsoring the U-Utilities project to ensure that some of the key gaps are closed before we ship 25.10. The sponsorship will primarily cover the development of the SE Linux support for common commands such as move, list, copy, etc. What are your thoughts on the fact that Ubuntu is pushing more and more Rust tools and programming on its users? It'll be an interesting year as Ubuntu is definitely leading this decision to adopt Rust in future releases. Will other Linux distributions follow? Time will only tell, but best believe Ubuntu is going to be a big player in all of this. Now on to a little bit of drama. Redis, a widely used in-memory database, sparked controversy in March of 2024 when it officially changed its licensing model from the permissive BSD license to a dual license approach using the Redis source available license, the RSALV2, and the server-side public license, SSPL version 1. This meant a shift that Redis was no longer considering open source under the open source initiative's definition, and it led to to significant backlash, including a signaling of departure from open source principles, an impact on cloud providers and community forks. Now, a little bit of backtracking. In May of 2025, we call for a Redis 8 is free, seriously, no games, just free and open source software. You read that right, it doesn't cost anything to start building your real-time apps and AI agents today. What are you waiting for? Well, we were waiting for an open source license. Anyways, now Redis 8 is now a GA loaded with new features and more than 30 performance improvements, but that's not what we're interested in. We're interested in the licensing here. As of this month, 
and actually just a few days ago, Redis has acknowledged the community's concerns and importance of open source principles. Redis has reverted to an open source license by adopting the Faro General Public License version 3, short for AGPL v3. This, of course, is for the 8 release. And for those of you who don't know, this license is a general public license that is free, copyleft for software and other kinds of works specifically designed to ensure cooperation with community in the case of network server software. Either way, with only a slight mention here in this fairly long post, it is a big deal that we officially have Redis available under the AGPL version 3 open source license. And this was mainly in guidance with Salvatore, their CTO, as it did take them a while to finally adhere to the principles of fostering open source as they fumbled for about a year. And now to talk about some security related things. There's officially an update that's a security update that fixes actively exploited a free type zero day vulnerability. As an out of bounds write in the free type library versions under 2.13 had a very high CVSS score of 8.1, which could potentially allow attackers to execute arbitrary code locally without user interaction or additional privileges has been actively exploited in targeted attacks since March of 2025, we finally see a update for the security vulnerability. The Android security bulletin contains several details of security vulnerabilities affecting Android devices, security patch levels for the 0505 to 2025 or later addresses all of these issues to learn how to check devices security patch level, check and update your Android device. The source code will be released in the Android Open Project repository in the next 48 hours and these updates are being made available so you'll definitely want to make an update to your android device given the severity and active exploitation of this it is important to make sure that your android device is updated promptly make sure to do this this is just a note that an official update is now available for android devices and finally we've received a wonderful breakdown of what actually happened in a timeline in a research paper called Wolves in the Repository, a software engineering analysis of the XZ utility supply chain attack, which was an attack that happened about a year ago in early 2024. It was a sophisticated supply chain attack that targeted the XZ utilities compression library and specifically in Linux systems. A malicious attacker going under the pseudonym Jiatan spent over two years building trust with the open source community to become a maintainer of the XZ Utilities project and tried to introduce a backdoor in versions 5.6 and 5.6.1. The target was designated to exploit the open SSH server or SSHD, and this allowed attackers to possess a specific private key to bypass SSH authentication, granting unauthorized remote access. It was discovered by Andres Frund, a Microsoft engineer who noticed unusual performance issues with SSH on Debian systems. And this was a very sophisticated attack with long-term social engineering infiltration. And that's what this paper is about. It explains not only what happened, but how it affected open source projects, maintainers, and even Linux. It's quite an extensive paper. And I have a video that goes in depth going through the analysis of this particular research paper. A very great read. I'm going to link my video below so you can go check this out if it's interesting to you. But that's about it for Linux news this week. Take a moment and subscribe below if you made it to the end of the video. You're a true fan. Also, smash that like button on the way up. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to SavvyNick.com now and get access to these sheets.